Good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's been a couple of weeks since I've seen everybody. Um, the one benefit of that is I can um, give, I guess, some love and greetings from other ecclesias from San Francisco. Um, I was there recently and with a bunch of people from Thousand Oaks, both in California. So they were very um, happy to learn about people that they knew and, and health and everything. So love and greetings from them, even though I'm obviously from here. Um, okay. So what I wanted to, I guess, discuss today, um, obviously is, is something that I've been thinking about. Um, and, and being out on a trip and, and travel for leisure, I, there was a couple things that were really on my mind. Um, and a big one for me, let me keep track of time. Okay. Okay. And a big thing for me that I've been thinking about recently, and I've been reading about and, and trying to improve in my life is habits, um, forming habits, forming good habits, etc. So, you know, I'm going to start there. Um, well, what, what do we know about habits? Well, they, as I said, they can be good or bad things. Um, they can be drinking water. Um, when you wake up in the morning, that's the first thing you do. Um, if you are hygienic and sanitary, it might be brushing your teeth first thing in the morning. Um, and there's di all sorts of different habits that, that we form and that we have um, and that are formed through our life and how we relate to the world around us. Um, and what is a habit? Well, it's a correlation. It's an impulse, something a craving, and then something that we do based on a cue, based on something that happens around us. We have a cue and in our brain, it drives us to do something. So you wake up, you might smell your breath, then you go brush your teeth. All like that. So um, more than you would even think, habits are very common. Like we all have habits and we're all completely habitual how many of us have sleep cycles the, a plan of how we sleep and what we do how many people have um set up kind of how they eat when they eat in the day um what they eat for breakfast if they eat breakfast and then talking about that to other people there's different habits that we all have and then obviously we can have habits that are bad as well that are harmful for us like when your nails get long instead of trimming them you might bite them and one problematic feature in this and that drives our habits is our nature um and we all struggle with that our our human nature our, our self-service and our desire to do things our way and to get what we deserve um, and for those around us as well, for those people that we are close with. And this instinct and this, this human nature, this, this way that we operate and this way that we are, it obviously impacts our habits. We do things because we want to serve ourselves. Um, we do things for dopamine rushes, we store money so that we can consume it in ways that we find enjoyable. Um, we steal, we badmouth other, other um, people. There's all sorts of ways that we can have faulty habits. So um, obviously what I think I'm getting at is that I have had habits and do have habits that are unsavory and that are, are not things that you would want and not things that a Christian would pride themselves, somebody who is said to follow Christ. So obviously these things are, there's something that you can try to change. And, and for me, I view myself as very habitual. I love certain processes and just doing those things and not thinking about it. Um, I love sleep and I love being in a sleep schedule, even though I'm never ever on a good one. Um, 
So yeah, that's something that I was seeking to improve. And, and I was reading up on it. And what I found, um, one thing that very much stood out to me in a book was it was, it was talking about motivation. And obviously motivation is important for everything that we do. What, what drives us to do the things that we do, how we act, um, what we eat, whether it's healthy, whether it is good, um, and it, it's supposed to drive you to change things. So I am a disciple of Christ. I don't want to snap at people when they say rude things to me. I don't want to think bad at, at them when these things happen. I would rather think of the character of Christ and act accordingly. Um, if you think of somebody that smokes or, or somebody that goes to the gym, they have a motivation to want to change that. Um, to, to stop smoking. You always hear smokers talking about they're going to stop and they want to. Um, and then you always hear people talk about the gym too, how they're going to go next week and next year. And it's my New Year's re resolution for the fifth year in a row. Um, and, and what I kind of, what, what thesis, what, what hypothesis was given to me was that motivation isn't isn't the most important or shouldn't only be considered when trying to change habits when trying to change what you do um so back to motivation when i'm when i'm happy when i'm motivated i act i go and i change my life i go to 6 6 a.m to the gym i talk nice to my my siblings and when i'm in a bad mood when i've had a bad day i'm more likely to fail and my motivation will not help me and what, what seems to happen is you get in this cycle where your mot my motivation is not cutting it. My desire to serve God is, is not enough. Um, and and you, you put this work into it and you constantly say, I'm motivated to do this. And to some extent, your, your motivation can get hurt and get, get tainted by continually failing and, and not reaching that goal which you hold yourself to. Um, we know obviously that grace exists with God, and that's one reason why we don't get concerned with these things, because we know that God has grace for us, and He and He will be with us. But what this study was saying, what this person was saying, is that what's equally or also important or more important is the environment that you are in. The where you are, what is around you, when you are trying to reach a goal, when you are trying to develop a certain habit, and the culture of people that you are with. These two things are, are great motivators for trying to hit that success, for trying to keep that habit. So if you're a smoker and you don't wanna smoke, you're not going to be around smokers all the time. You're gonna try and stay away from that. You're going to move your office or, or hopefully not be close to a bunch of people that go outside and smoke on their, on their break. Um, you try and change that culture. I mean, that's why we're here. We're, we're here to remember Christ um, and remember his life. And hopefully that takes meaning in, in our lives. And we, we reflect and we change how we act. And two, the environment. So for not only is it the culture, the people that you are with, but for a smoker, where are you? What's around you? Do you go into the corner store and there's smokes all along the counter behind you? And that, and that drives you to, when you pay for gas, get that as well. Um, do you, or if, if there was, let's say, um, if there was covers on all of it, then you wouldn't see that. Um, and if you paid for gas at the pump, then you wouldn't even go there. You wouldn't even get close to that thing that you're trying to prevent against. So there's ways that we can manipulate our environment, what's around us to, to reach that goal. 
And it's not that, that we can change a habit completely. It's not that I can just say, okay, now I'm at the gym and, and we're set. I am going to the gym consistently and there's no problems. But there's small changes that you can do. You can change your drive. So when you drive home, you drive past the gym. You can put your gym clothes with your work clothes and when you go to work you put them in your car now you're more likely to go um, and you can keep going down this path of okay now sit in the parking lot now go inside and sit there for five minutes and and pay that fee and you're not going to be as lazy because you're not spending an hour or or two hours there it's a small commitment and eventually you build up that ability to do it so on my travels, I had, um, so focusing on environment, that, that is a part that we can focus on. We are motivated, we have faith and we love our God. And two, we are focused on, on changing the things around us, on improving ourselves so that we can more thoroughly um, mimic Christ in his life. So there was a Jew um, when I was climbing a mountain um, and I had a conversation with him and it was a long conversation and we were running up a mountain and we were talking about our faith. Um, and one of the things that came up, there was a bunch of things, was what do you do to show your love for God? And that was his comment to me. And it was very easy what he did. He studied two to three times a day. He did, he was circumcised. Um, he did no work on the Sabbath. Um, and, and that was pretty extensive in, in what that means. Um, you obviously can't physically work, um, but for him and the depth of his belief, it too was, um, was not keeping a key in his pocket at all, not keeping anything in his pocket, not even opening a door. So he was a traveler he found it very difficult to find Airbnbs that would leave the door open for him so that he could actually use the space. So those actions were his way and molding what he did and constraining himself um, as we do as well in being servants was his way of showing God that he loved him. So what do you do to show your love for God? So. Going back to Nehemiah, Nehemiah is an excellent e e example. Um, and it really stood out to me because of how much he acted, how much he prayed, and how much he seemed to act correctly. And those changes that he made in his life to further direct himself towards those goals and to developing a relationship with God, they seemed to get him there. And, and that was, that's making me think on this um, subject of habits of what are the things that we do, um, what is important about those things so that we can augment our faith, we can augment our motivation and our desire to serve our God um, and change our lives accordingly. So um, I'm mostly looking at Nehemiah in the first like seven chapters, so not even in chapter nine, but that was useful anyways for this. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, so what are the things that that? Um, oh, and then one note I wanted to mention, just to be so that you're cognizant and maybe wary of the Jewish mindset, which we all are. Um, we know Paul tells us that it's not circumcision of the flesh, but it's circumcision of the heart. And he it was completely new to, to this Jew that I was talking about motivations and drivers and why I do these things. And for him, that wasn't even involved. It was, I listen to my God. And that's truly part of it. But God tells us things so that we know them, so that we understand them, and we can act them out, and that we can continue to build on, on the word of God and act, act correctly in our lives. So what are things that Nehemiah does? Well, in chapter one, right out the gate, he approaches. He approaches the king. And I mean, this is kind of a big deal. Um, 
he's he's approaching a king um, in in Nehemiah two. Um, ver verse one. I took up the wine. I had not been before sad in his presence. And the king asks him, "Why? Why are you sad? Um, why? Why are you having problems? What's the matter?" And and one commentary that I read was saying that his how his face was, and um, in the Hebrew, his countenance was sad. It could have been perceived that he was up to something. That there was something that that Nehemiah was doing. That this could have been a threat to the king. This could have been something that immediately was this is wrong. You have to act this way in front of the king. You you shouldn't do it. And you're off. You're gone. Maybe dead. So even just being sad, which is something he never had done, was it was a big deal in this case. Um. And, and we know that he prayed about this in, in verse 11 of chapter 1. Grant him mercy or compassion in the sight of this man. So he wants compassion here. He knows that this could be a problem. And in verse 2 of chapter 2, he was sore afraid after the king asked him, why are you sad? Because how could the king respond? Um, but what we know is that the king um, listened to him. The king was concerned about why he was upset and he heard him out um, and he listened to him in that case as well. So the things that Nehemiah does, well, he approaches the king and something that could have turned out very bad for him. Um, he has good answers to Tobiah. So somebody in the, in the people, in the group around them was consistently trying to subvert, trying to hurt and, and mold to what his will was, um, the works, and the actions of the people of Israel and constantly trying to trick. And the answer to this, one of one of the answers to this by Nehemiah is in Nehemiah 4, verse 4 and 5, when they're mocking the Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they f sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones? And Nehemiah says, Hear, O God, we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So he looks for justice in these people. Um, earlier in Nehemiah, he talks about the reproach of Israel and what they have done wrong. But here he goes to, to God and says, well, this is their reproach. And this is how they're hurting the people of Israel, your people. Um, so how, how does he show God that he loves them? How, how does he act on his faith? Well, he, um, he, he prays for justice um, against, against sinners, basically. What else does he do? He, he ignores them to an extent. In verse 14, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. So he, he gets them to be ready to fight. And then in verse 15, their counsel is brought to naught. So the other aspect here, too, is that God's, God is wondrous. His, his actions are mighty. Um, and... When he answers our prayer, we don't even understand what necessarily is happening. These, these problems that we face are, are dealt with, and, and Nehemiah can continue to move on and continue to act. Um, another huge issue was, was with slavery, was dealing with the slavery of their own people um, in, chapter, in chapter 5. Um, this is a big deal, them enslaving their own brothers. And again, this is another way where he's unhappy with the status of the ecclesia, with the status of, and not even just the ecclesia, with, with himself too, with what is going on. And he's seeking to make sure that it's abiding by the will of God. 
So he's constantly acting and, and it kind of seems very brash in, in certain actions, in certain, certain parts of it. Um, but we know what his goals are. We know what his motivations are through this all. Um, in, in chapter one, he starts out in, with his prayers in that to help those that are afflicted, to help those that are in captivity, um, and to fix the broken walls and to fix the gates. The, the goal of this whole thing for Nehemiah was to bring the people back into fellowship with the name of God, back into fellowship with their God. He wanted, he had a desire to fear God. He wanted the people to fear God and not to be a reproach among the nations because they didn't at that time. So he had this motivation that is completely true. He had a motivation to act and, and to do the will of, the go of God. Um, in Nehemiah 5, when considering the brothers, um, selling, selling their, their family, verses eight, verses eight and nine. He says, ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? They weren't supposed to enslave each other. They were servants to their God and they loved him and acted on that. So they were completely doing something against the will of God. And he, Nehemiah was able to pick that up. Same in six, verse 12, he was able to perceive that Tobiah was acting incorrectly. I perceive that God had not sent him. So he's continually able to look at the will of God, to look at the word and to judge and to question in his life um, how people relate to him and his motives to serve his God. We know that he was constantly, um, and, and so how did he do all this? He did this through prayer. Um, it was effectual and fervent. It was definitely of a righteous man. Um, he, he prayed that men did not have control over him, similar to David. Um, he prayed for compassion from the king. And, and that is similar language to David as well, um, that these people would not be able to, to control um, him, but God would be able to control what happened. Um, he set up prayer checkpoints. He was constantly praying and he would make a prayer um, and that's represented in chapter one. And as soon as he had compassion from the king, well, then he prayed again for exactly what that next aspect would be. And with Tobiah, he prayed for justice. So he was motivated to serve God. He was constantly looking how to, to measure that against the will of God. He did it through his prayer and he acted too. He began repairing the wall. He saw that need. He saw the need for security. He saw the need for the people to be together. Um, in 4 verse 20, when they were concerned about um, being invaded. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither to us, our God shall fight for us. So continuing to draw together, to be among people that had the same goals, to be connected in that setting, to not be tempted by things that other people were doing, to find that household of faith. And he got involved. He couldn't go to Tobiah because he had a great work that he had to do. It's the same thing. If, if we have something we really, really want to do, you um, want to lose weight and you go to the gym for, for that purpose, you really have to put a lot of time and effort into that. You probably should be going at least three times a week. That's a big commitment. And that is the same thing with our God. Um, he got involved in that he didn't even take off his clothes. When, when he was not working, when he was not physically working, um, he was on guard. They were on guard. They could not take off of their clothing except for washing. They were continuously involved in that, that building of the house um, of Jerusalem and, and creating that relationship again with their God. 
So what do we do? What do we do to continue to develop our faith, to show it, and to show that our faith is healthy? Um, we know, well, we, we preach to all around us. We don't just preach at events. We do that too, or, or at lectures. We do that as well. But we preach to all people we see. Are we honest about, about what we are doing and why are we doing it? Um, we preach to the young people, any, any young person involved with the CYC and, and helping um, run that and helping serve in that way, they are, um, they are preaching to, to the other young people. They are showing that example of Christ and seeking for those people to, to draw themselves to God. We, we put each, each other's needs first. We should be serving the poor. Um, I'm not saying we're not. We, we, we serve the poor and we suffer ourselves to be defrauded. Um, again, we're, we're putting others' needs above our own. So I, I'd like to continue to draw to that building aspect. And that's where I kind of like to end this. Um, I like the physicality of it. Um, so in Nehemiah 5, we could say that that famine that they first had that caused them to sell their brethren was because of what? Because they were building their own houses. And that's in Malachi 3. Malachi 3. Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the fields of the Lord. Um, and, and when does that happen? When is the devourer not on them? When they bring the tithes into the storehouse? In verse 10. And all through 5, 5 to 10. If they, if they don't, if they're not false swearers, um, if they don't oppress the hireling, the widow, if they don't turn aside the fatherless and the stranger. So if, if, they, if they do these things, if they do what God expects them to do, um, then this famine won't be upon them. If they, if they make sure they're building the house of God first before they're building their own. So, what do we know? Well, we know that we are the temple of God. And I'm going to go to Ezekiel 43, verse 11. Oh, not in that version. Uh, you've got to read it before me. Okay. As for you, son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the plan. If they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the house, its structure, its exits, its entrances, all its designs, all its statutes, and all its laws, and write it in their sight, so that they may observe its whole design and all its statutes and do them. This is the law of the house, its entire area on the top of the mountain, it shall be most holy. This is the law of the house. So the design of the house, the structure, the, the exits, the entrance, and in architecture, this is a big deal. What you do and what is the purpose of it and what is the symbolism? Um, and we know, and in part, we, we see that. We see the purpose of the sacrifices on one hand, the symbolism of that, and we see the purpose of the temple, um, what it's supposed to be, um, what, it, what the holiest place is supposed to be. And I think what we're supposed to understand is, is, is how much work it takes to get there and how everything needs to be pure and everything needs to be perfect. And this is something that it's, it's difficult, there's a lot of information to it, but we're supposed to observe the whole design. 
we're supposed to understand the statutes and what that's what we're supposed to get out of this building. So if our body is a temple, if we are the temple of God and we're supposed to build on it these things, then for me and my habits and, and what I do and what I see and what I think, where I move to, um, what my hands do, um, what I hear and how I understand it, all of these things are part of that. They're part of that body. They're part of that temple. And we obviously have problems. We have problems with the lust of the flesh, with the lust of the eyes, with the pride of life. And we need to take, to look at these aspects of us and we look at these um, components and we need to treat them like a building. We need to treat them like there's a leaky roof. And well, what is that? Well, my eyes are seeing things that they shouldn't. They're desi I'm desiring things that I shouldn't be. How do I set myself in a better position to fight that? Do I, do I not go to that same place? Um, do I read certain readings before I have to do some activity? Um, for me, I think I need to take to be critical and obviously healthy criticism of all of those different aspects of what I do and of what I think and to measure it up to God is, and to measure it up to Christ and is this what he would do? Um, that's how I have to view this physical building. So what I wanna end with is in, in Luke five, but, we, but before we go there, there's a couple of verses. We know that faith is the substance of things hoped for. We know it's the evidence of things not seen. What we don't see is almost more important than what we do see because that's our faith acting. That's reliance on God. That's Elijah with the, um, with the angels all around him. We know that faith moves mountains. That's faith, something that isn't easily graspable for me, not something that's easily understood. And it's moving something that's physical. That's very real, it's moving mountains. Um, so what I get out of this comparison, what I get out of our body being a temple is that we need to take, we need to take um, growth and growth in the truth. We need to take it literally. We need to take it as things that we do. And not that we are, oh, woe is me, we're horrible, and that we don't rely on grace of God. Obviously that's true, but we should be continually changing things, fine tuning, ourselves on that walk so we come to luke 5 and i and i love this story this is probably well it's my favorite story with christ and behold men brought in a in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude they went up to the house top and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So what, so what does this, what does this show? Well, he has faith in verse 23. What is easier to say? Sins be forgiven thee or rise up and walk. He obviously, this group of people obviously had faith to bring him to Christ. And what, what happened next? Well, there was a problem. There was an issue. Um, the issue was that there was multitudes around Christ. They could not get to him. Um, they could not reach him. And what did they do? Well, they took something that for us is so physical and is so real, and they treated it differently. They acted out of faith. The evidence of things not seen, they ripped apart the roof completely so that they could get to Christ. And that's how they showed their faith. So the whole point of this story is, is showing faith, is seeing obstacles, and knowing that our, our, our faith can be activated to, to get us closer to Christ, to get us close to him. 
to build up the walls, to build up the temple, to do those things and activities that bring us into fellowship with him. So as we come to the emblems, that's what I think I want us to remember, to continue to build on that foundation that we are the temple of God and to continue to act, act out of faith in these abilities. We know that um, Christ's body, that the temp his temple was torn down in three days and raised again, and that we too will be raised with him if we continue in this. Thank you.